cracking weekend. Not so much. I've got, got some exciting ins insights about the market. I know there's not much exciting happening in the market, but obviously you're doing something on perpetuals this morning, so I don't want to... Well, that's okay. I want to. I want to. I want to hear your opinions because my opinion. What's what, my opinion is that this market sucks and it's boring, and and that we're probably not going to pick direction with any accuracy right now. Um, let's have a look at your opinions. Nice. Before, fuck them all up. Yeah. So, uh, just a couple of precursors before we start. Then Scott has looked at more charts than I've looked at steak and kidney pies. So he doesn't need to do any of these funny pictures. These funny pictures just let me look at things in a kind of logical manner. So what these boxes represent is the, the pre-halving period, the post-halving period, and then the exponential mm -hmm. post-halving period. And I could have picked a better chart and gone back over more cycles. So I'm only looking at the last cycle and it's just for illustration, okay? So what it is, we can look back four years and we can be like, well, what did it do four years ago? And obviously we want to look back again. And then we can see that this is where COVID is. But generally, this is what we were sort of expecting to happen over here. And this is what you call the pre-harbing retrace. So it comes down. It's an opportunity for the for bargain buying of Bitcoin. Then we have the halving event. And then we're and then we're off. Now, this year, we're looking, and this it looks completely different. So it's like, well, okay, then all bets are off then. This is, has this ever happened again? Well, I don't, I don't think so. All right, then. So what actually is happening then? So we're in a range. Your black lines might slightly differ from mine, but we're in this range. You're about sort of 34. I agree. I think we can, I think we can all agree that's objectively true i'm going to quibble with some of your other stuff and wash mm -hmm. your brain out a little bit in in a moment but but that is absolutely objectively true we are in a range and how do we know we're in a range because it's behaving like a range because ranges behave differently they fuck you around and if anyone if we had to characterize how we've been the last two weeks i think fucked around is probably about right so you're yeah. absolutely right on that yeah because one of the, you know, just keeping things at the really basic level, the first question that you ask yourself every day is, is it a trend or is it a trading range? Bingo. Bingo. That's a simple question. Now, where this gets interested is we are in a trading range, in a trading range. So mm. we've got this kind of little trading range going up here and we keep getting these wicks to the upside. So these wicks to the upside, they keep testing the resistance but they can't they can't they can't oh, yeah. oh, 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 dude well let's use testing the resistance what a what is a wick is an opportunity for people to take profits right so any every one of those wicks is traders is traders saying wow i've had a good run on them out and so the implication of that is that we've got new traders positioned not the old guys. We've got we, we have we, bef th those wicks represent guys who might have been holding from sixteen or twenty thousand, like you, cashing their chips, like we did, like we cashed our chips out. Oh, the wicks up, Barry. So in terms of support and resistance, that can be that, but you can't quite you can't quite come and say that. Like like let's stick to let's stick to what we know, and then and then build up from what we know to what we think and what we impute and let's apply probabilities to all this so great great job so far keep going okay so my kind of conclusion with this is to sort of where is bitcoin going to go well i think that our clues are going to come from this this tight range that we're in at the moment so if we keep going over above it above it and taking profit then the chances are we're going to keep on going if we keep getting the downside wicks and we keep going below it and keep going below it, then there's a greater chance that we could break to the to the downside. This is on the weekly chart. So obviously, if you keep going down the the time frames, then you can see this play out in more kind of <clears throat> intricate detail. I like it at the weekly and the monthly because it's kind of like, okay, there's not too much noise on this chart. This is great. This, this is a very clean view. Yeah. You know? So linking right back to what you said when we started the call, it's like, 
this what is this market doing? Well, I don't know. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, 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 I don't know. So it makes it very difficult to pick that direction. Who's okay, in so, so here's the thing. Here's the thing, dude. Do you think the totality of the evidence is that we're in a bull market or a bear market, or we've got no evidence either way? That's a great question. Given that a bull market has certain characteristics, one of the characteristics is when a bull market kicks off, it kicks off hard out the gate because it leaves mm. people on the sidelines. Have we got that? Yes, we've got that. When a bull market kicks off, it kicks off from a place where everyone hates it so fucking bad and not just hates it. They're just sick of it. I'm sick of watching it. I've stopped checking it. Fuck this stupid fucking game. Fuck this game. Did we have that? We we certainly did. In the bull market, the first pullback of any type on the market isn't what people want. People want doesn't doesn't let people doesn't give people easy op a bull market tends to run away without giving people easy entries, forcing people to make rough decisions on the hard right edge of the chart. It puckers your ass a little bit to buy. Mm. Mm. Is that what we felt like? I think it feels like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um okay, keep going. That's pretty much my take on on there. The only other thing I was going to mention was is I think that Ethereum had a pretty strong monthly close. And I think that we could see some strength in ETH over the next few weeks whilst Bitcoin is kind of doing this. Oh, I can't compete with that interruption. Ice cream tomorrow. What about today? Yeah, you eat ice cream today. I want to eat ice cream with you, baby girl. Okay. Okay. We'll go to the best. It's good that the dog is eating my sock, baby. That's really good. I like that. Come on. Get the fuck away from my sock. <laughs> Come on. Everyone had to go. Come on. Baby, can you save my sock? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Bye. -bye. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, we guys. Keep going. Yeah, so that was that was me pretty much at the end with my my thoughts on Bitcoin and my final can you, comment. Can was, you bring your chart up again, please? Yeah, because we might have a little bit of a clue that goes in advance on the hard right edge of the weekly chart. What pattern do you see? Uh, lower close, higher close, lower close forming. Well. We have a significant high, the highest high in 10 bars. We have one or more lower closes, and we have one or more higher closes. So on the break of this weekly bar, I would become more bearish than I am right now. Mm -hmm. Where would, On the break to the upside of that black line, which I think you've drawn really well, um, I would become more bullish. Is that about what it is? Yeah. About? Yeah. The totality of what we've got is it looks... Like a duck, it acts like a duck, it quacks like a duck. It's a bull market. Mm -hmm. um, bull markets do not make it easy. There's a reason why it's called a bull. Why do you think that is? Because it's a wild animal. It tries to buck you off. That's <laughs> its job. Its job is to, is, is to, what are we, I'm, you know, half in FinRev, half in cash right now. If we if we saw a weekly close up up high, I would have to chase that market, wouldn't I? Mm -hmm. Like a sucker, I would actually have to chase. Yeah, that could happen. I can't rule that out. There's a lot of laser eyes motherfuckers who are like, "Well, it's a bull market. We're already counting our cash. I'm I'm going to make eight figures this cycle." Blah blah blah. The highest probability. What's the highest probability at any point in time in the market? It'll do the opposite to what the most amount of people think. It fucks the most amount of people. So so if, if you want to know what the highest probability outcome here, what's the thing that fucks the people most? That we go down. And then up. Right. Mm -hmm. Down and then up hard. Yeah. I think that has to be the first probability here. Do you want to show us Ethereum? Because I think that's very interesting that you've got there. Yeah. 
don't think I've got as many wiggly lines on Ethereum. Well, you, you, you don't need them. Uh, Marlon's saying exactly the correct thing is clean out the weekend. So we have a slightly weaker, um, we have a slightly weaker close and the same pattern. Significant high, lower close, higher close. If we broke that weekly low, I would start to become quite bearish on the market. Mm. Now, let me, do you mind if I share my screen? That's really good analysis, man. I, I think that's, uh, I, I think that's pretty good. Thank you. Um, by the way, I just did some checking of shakes before I do it. So, top 10 drawdowns, top 10 drawdowns chart. These are the top 10 drawdowns of, these are the worst five drawdowns of Bitcoin. 93, 84%, 83%, 76, 70. I just thought it was interesting. I just thought it was interesting. Um, and I found this cool site where you can benchmark it against stocks and you can see that, um, wait, if I benchmark it properly. Let's benchmark it against Microsoft a year you can see over the last year bitcoin you know more or less you, you know microsoft's going down it, it, it's looking it's behaving like big tech let's compare it to some of the other ones broadly speaking behaving the same way i think what the what the stock market is telling us and the liquidity situation in JPOW is telling us is that they don't have the balls to crash this market in an election year and we're going to get a lot of liquidity and very, very favourable macroeconomic conditions for crypto in general. Now, before we move on, um, let me just uh, take a quick look around FinRev. Because FinRev is generally better than either of us. So let's look at Bitcoin first and let's zoom in a bit. You can see we've got quite a lot of dispersion between forecasts. The, the little dot plots are our individual forecasts. And one of the tricks with systematic trading is that any system can be wrong and often will be wrong, right? Like you, you, you're developing a set of rules. An average of systems tends to do better, statistically tends to do better in the same way that a portfolio of multiple coins tends to do better than just putting all your money in one coin. Um, so, so what have we here? We have it, you know, going down slightly day and day. And where are we? We're at 7.5. So 10 is a normal position. 20 is a maximum position. 7.5, halfway between. Uh, 7.5 is like cautiously optimistic kind of thing. So what I'm saying is that FinRev is a little bit more optimistic than me, and I think I should be honest about that. Let's look at Ethereum. 4.5, a bit less than a half position. So FinRev is basically, it's a bull market, but I don't trust this right here. I think that's pretty fair for altcoins. Um, let's look at AVAX. Same. Uh, anything in the chat you guys want me to, to quickly bring up for FinRev? Just, just let me know. Just, uh, It was a really cool FinRev video you sent out on an email. I'm just going to drop the loom of that into the chat. So we, um, I don't know if I have it on this dashboard. I might have to jump across to... Um, no, let's jump across to actual FinRev. I'm my fucking CTO, Timon. I just can't get him to under-fucking stand that you can't run your account at this volatility target. And he's like, oh, but I put $220 in and now I've got eight grand. Like, what are you telling me? It's wrong. It's like, you're guaranteeing. You, you, like, look at this. He put in 245 bucks and ran it up to 96.90 and now he's like 7.9. This is using an irresponsible volatility target that I would not let any of you guys do. And because he's won, he thinks it's proof that 
that it's a good idea. But what he's actually done here is he's like, he's decided to conduct an N of one experiment, a one, a one sample experiment. And he's decided to see if uh, driving across town, just running every red traffic light can get him to his destination faster. And, you know, he, he's, he's broken all speed records to get to his destination and thinks that this is the way that he should commute from now on, just ignoring red lights. So this is what you shouldn't do. But um, Sui. No, we're not trading Sui at the moment. Um, let me just have a quick look at it. We have no position in Sui. That's interesting. Um, I think you'd have to call this one could go either way. I'm a little bit concerned by this. This bar is a is a FOMO is a, is a FOMO bar. Any bar that you see where it's got an open at or near the lows and a close at or near the highs and a very big range can only be caused by all day the balls are totally in control. And usually that's people FOMOing into a coin and usually that doesn't end well. This could this could go long, this could go short. I, I wouldn't want to take a guess on that. Um, MKR. Eight point four. I mean, that looks like a pretty reasonable chart to me. Uh, Stephen Johnson, is Finrad more bullish or bearish balanced right now? Well, um, I've, I've got uh, I've got Timon's account open, so uh, let's look at that um, portfolio, and let's sort it by position size, and you can see that. Actually, let's sort it by notional value. So we're sorting it by position size. These are the biggest positions. The biggest positions are long. Got a couple of shorts mixed in there. And then we're getting down to small, like in that trading is an trading is an 80-20 occupation, like like almost everything in life. So the top 20 positions will give you 80% of the results, right? So where are we now? We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Um, I would, th that's pretty balanced. That's pretty long biased. Um, probably, uh, a bit less than an average long position. Um, really good question. Stephen, VRL, happy to do it. I never heard of this one. Um, Boy, what a chart. What a chart. Does that qualify as a boner breakout? Yeah. I I mean, you know, honestly, you've missed this one. But this you've missed this one, but if it keeps going, boy, it's gonna surprise to the upside. Yes. If you ever catch one of these, the thing to do is to sell 25% of what you've got left every time you feel like bragging about it, every time you do a little like, okay, I have to sell 25%, and you gradually, gradually get out. That's how you do it. BLZ. Oh, so good. Fucking hate BLZ. It's going, it's going down. So it's a negative three. It's a small, short position. Now, this neatly illustrates the difference between a discretionary trader, like, um, let's show a bit more data. So you can see it went short here. Um, we went short here. So the difference between a discretionary trader like Ian and I, um, using some skill and judgment and intuition and experience and blah, 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 and uh, a mechanical system with a set of rules is that we're a bit quicker on the we're a bit quicker on the jump, right? Like Ian, you're you're like noticing things a little bit before Finrev would happen. Finrev, compared to you and I, more emotionally stable. Mm -hmm. More willing to, oh, sorry, that um, Zoom doesn't like me. Uh, um, uh, Zoom doesn't like me raising my thumb. It freezes the video. So it's it's more emotionally stable. 
it's capable of doing more coins simultaneously. So it has more swings at bat than you and I are capable of managing. It's very willing to reverse its opinion if, if it's wrong. Whereas myself, I can be a bit stubborn and I can get cognitive biases where I just don't notice that I fucked up for a little bit too long. Um, Beal said, this looks like a wonderful short to me. I mean, I'm still short. Uh, let's have a look at how short I am. I'm short 36,000 bucks of this and I'm $4,800 in profit off $7,200 in margin. And you can see that all of our shorts looking pretty fucking great, tasty, with the exception of... With the exception of this one, Ethereum Bitcoin, which on a larger time frame, I still think this one's pretty good. I am hold this one. Um, LCX. So this and there was a shank for Matic as well. Sure. Um, I I mean that's obviously a brilliant um brilliant breakout. If you're holding this, I'd keep holding it. Like it looks like it's gonna go. It's the market went down, it went up. That's a strong sign. I mean, well done to you for holding up LCX. Um, I think it's a buy right here too. Um, a cautious buy. Don't go, don't get anything that's already gone. Don't get nuts with it. Just just be cool. Whatever you think you want to buy, buy half of that. Um, Miles. Uh sorry, I'm I'm Matic. So what's what have we got here? We've clearly got a trading range. FinRev started gank, getting out of its, you know, it scaled out of its positions, took a small short and got out of that, didn't work. It's no opinion, basically. Pendle. Boy. Sorry. I mean, that, that's weekly chart. I mean, that's just a beautiful chart. Okay, it looks like we're going to have an upward channel overthrow here. An upward channel overthrow tends to be the last phase of a move. So what I mean, and to get you guys to understand this, is a channel is a weakening trend. So the trend was super strong here. doesn't look it now. But the trend was actually stronger on a percentage basis. If I change this to a log scale, the trend was stronger back then. This is a weakening channel caused by people going, wow, I've made so much fucking money. I better take some profits. Wow, I made so much money. I better take some profits. And dip buyers stepping into it. This can go two ways. The normal way is for it to come back down this way and then go. If it overthrows the top side, generally that's a final fling, like a blow off toppy type thing. And it looks like we're just starting to blow off top. So this would probably be a point to add to that position. If if I was in this, which I'm not, I would add to that position today. Um, I, I think Pendle is, is demonstrably strong. It's showing lots of strength. It's a high beta coin. It's a small coin. So it should be stronger, but fuck yeah. Looks great. Um, I, I would, you know, if you're going to buy it, today's the day to buy it, and I would buy it like like right the fuck now. In fact, I might buy a little bit of it just to keep myself just to buy some fucking pendle. Hey, all right, yeah, beauty. Um, how much are we going to buy? Let's just buy five grand worth, worth to keep us in the game, right? Okay, and let's what's the what's the order book like? You can see at a glance that there's more buyers than sellers in this order book. Um, okay, so let's click mid, and I'm willing to pay up five. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about where do you place your orders? When a market is running and it's clearly running, like let's look at the five minute chart, it's about to run now. You don't want to be, you don't, the way that I think of it is, don't be a dick for a tick. So I'm going to make my order. I'm 
I got a yeah. So I'm I mean, um, so I, I make my order a little bit up just so that I I make sure. So now we got five grand worth of this, and you know it, it's not a big position, but it forces me to pay attention to it. Like like now I have to now I have to look at the chart, right? And I have to make sure. Okay. Um, you want that sent out as an alert, Scott, for Pendle? Yeah. Um, yeah, please. Tactical. Thank you. All right. Now, let's move on to what I really wanted to cover today. Um, what I want to cover is perpetual futures. And we're going to start with regular, plain old finance Um normal futures which expire either monthly quarterly either monthly or quarterly so for example um futures tra futures trading was my career for like like long before i'd heard of crypto like i was i was you know 90 90 plus percent of my trading career has been in traditional finance futures so for example in gold the the contracts expire in august december March and June. No, May and June. Um, for crude oil and natural gas, they have a contract that expires every month. For the S&P 500 futures, they expire um, March, June, September, and December. So there's, there's set expiries. Now, what this means is that they're tethered. The futures price is not the price of gold. The futures price is the price of gold in three months or when that expiry happens. Now, you can imagine that if there's an interest rate, like we have a 5% interest, 4% interest rate right now, when there's an interest rate, the thing should be worth less because, you know, you, you should get, it, it's the equivalent of money in the bank. The, the future is the present value, right? Now, because the future, because the future price of gold and, and the spot price of gold trade independently, they can get out of whack. Like, how do they get out of whack? Well, for a start, someone could get their stops run and they could push up the futures price or push up the spot price. Someone could uh, someone could go broke and get their positions unwound. And these are forced and constrained sellers. So forced and constrained sellers push the price far from fair value. Now, there's other types of anyone who's trading for reasons that are not economic reasons is likely to be trading at a bad price. Now, this is fundamental to understand. There is in, in the institutional industry, you have to present your positions. You have to report them. Like if you're a hedge fund, you have to report them to the SEC. If you're trading some degenerate stock that you would, that would be really embarrassing for people to, to know that you owned, you don't want that coming up on your report. You will get rid of it before you have to report it to your investors or your boss. And so there's a lot of weird effects that happen around end of month, end of quarter, tax loss harvesting. There's also reasonable basis to, 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 to uh, so anyone who's trading for a reason that's not about economics, because they're being forced to trade like a stop loss or their business went broke, or because they don't want their boss to see what a fuck with they've been in, in, in the company account, um, they'll probably trade at bad price. So these these prices can get out of whack and the entire industry of most of what you see in finance in terms of market makers, Jane Street, Optiva, all of those big algo firms, like the, by far, like I'm talking like 90% of all volume in every stock exchange in the world is guys pushing those prices back to where they should be. Price gets out of whack. They sell it until it comes, they, they, they short it and it comes back down. If they're buying something cheap, they buy it cheap and it comes back to fair value. That's a very, very competitive game because they're not there. Why is it competitive? Because their win rates are, are not like ours. We're talking like 55%, 60% win rate. I'm thrilled. Those guys, they're like 85% win rate. It's a very, very, very attractive opportunity. And an opportunity that's attractive is attractive to others and it's highly competitive. And, and all those masters of the universe fucking top tier traders, they're all fighting against each other for the same scraps. 
So it's quite obvious that markets aren't totally efficient, but they're nearly efficient. And the whole industry of finance, there's two industries in finance. One is the allocation industry, and the and the other is 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 price fluctu is uh, price fluctuations. I'm getting off track, nerding out, which I'll do. So here's the Bitcoin contract, which happened to be on FTX on November on November 21, 2021, and you can see that the future was above actual spot Bitcoin. But it expires on, on the 31st of December. If you're on November 21, you don't know how much these things are going to wiggle and in what direction. But you know that on December 21, they're both going to be the same number. They are going to converge. This is the central understanding that if you're buying Bitcoin cheap here, this lets you do a thing called a basis trade. Why would those things get out of whack? They get out of whack because, you know, for example, they got really out of whack in the 2021 bull because there was a demand for, for leveraged exposure. And the supply comes from traders like James. This is James's slide, who was doing an arbitrage. So this is what's called a basis trade, where he buys the spot. He buys five Bitcoins and he shorts five Bitcoins, knowing that he's going to short five Bitcoins and no matter what happens to Bitcoin, it's going to converge with the index on that price, on that day. So in three months time, you know, you'll get this premium, less your transaction costs. So you can lock in a profit that happens no matter what the market does. If the market goes up, you still get your profit. If the market goes down, you still get your profit, but you get it in three months. So that that is what's called a basis trade. And let's look at some basis trades right now. This is very, very useful data. So this is our, this is our annualized basis on Bitcoin. And you can see if someone can take a risk-free profit of 20%, without taking any directional risk at all, no matter what happens, they're going to get this money, 19.85%. That is a very, very attractive trade. Now, the downside of that trade is you got 20%, everyone else quadrupled their money, but you got 20% without taking any risk. And let's not forget that institutional traders are all about, don't fire me, please don't fire me. You know, to have, to, to be to beat your benchmark without having any risk of losing your job and get a multi-million dollar business without any bonus, without any risk. That's a fucking attractive thing. So this isn't the trade that we're doing, but it's it's the one that's easiest to understand is to buy the spot and short the futures and you get a guarantee, you get a guaranteed return. Okay, who understands this so far? Buy the spot, short the futures is called a basis trade. You can check the basis trade interest rate on velodata.app and go to TradFund. And we can see it compared to Ethereum. Ethereum is down to 7.4%. That's not very attractive right now. Okay. Understand, don't understand? Okay, I know this is nerdy stuff, guys. Like, like you don't need to know this. Like, this is just because we've got some questions and and, you know... What could fuck this up? This is what's called a carry trade, by the way. This is this is one of the most heavily done trades in all of finance. And these carry trades exist in gold. They exist in oil. They exist in uranium. They exist everywhere. Yeah, Stephen, if you do that every quarter, that's a fucking great return. But there's a catch. There's always a catch. The catch is, let's say, a six, let's say you let's say Bitcoin goes up. Your long has risen in value and you're short has shrunk has shrunk in value so they're out of balance so you have to keep these two trades balanced and you have to do that which it's called rebalancing if you don't do that you could get margin called and liquidated which sucks us now this is going to get more practical very very soon i'm going to show you some risk free directional free ways to make really really good money like like 100 to 200% a year doing this. We're going to get to that today. So you might think that 
looks very easy from the cheap seats, but you can see this blowouts can happen. You know they're going to meet at the expiry, but these blowouts. And if you're using a leverage position, if you've got 20 to 1 leverage, you know, these, these blowouts could really fucking ruin your whole day. And they can force you to sell down your position to, to get out of it. So that doesn't mean that it's not a good trade. This is still an amazing trade. You just have to do something for it. Like it's not free money, it's return for risk. And we know that because if a trade was high reward, if it was super easy and Muppets could do it, and it was super low risk, then everyone would ape into it. And very, very quickly, any super profitable thing that everyone knows about stops being super profitable and starts fucking the people who know about it. Uh, like ugh, like the Bitcoin ETF. Like as soon as everyone figured it out, it was like where there's a tip, there's a tap, right? Now, the key point is that all of these carry trades are a subtype of trading called risk premium trading. There's something that sucks about all of them. This um, FinRev is risk premium harvesting too. There's something that sucks about FinRev and you can see it very clearly on Timon's account. What sucks about FinRev? This and this. They go sideways for long periods of a time. That's what that's what sucks about it. That's what you get paid for. You got to understand no one's paying you money because you're so smart and you know all about crypto. That's just fucking nonsense. Grow the fuck up. You're getting paid for taking a risk. Why would anyone pay you to take that risk? Because there's something, there's always something about this risk that sucks to, to, to actually do. And so the way that I'd like you to understand it is your toilet is clogged. It's clogged with nasty, nasty brown shit. You have to pay the plumber 400 bucks to, to come, come unclog it. Or you could do it yourself. You're perfectly capable of working a plunger. Who's calling the who's calling the plumber and who's doing it themselves in the chat? Serious. Who's who's calling the plumber? Who's doing it themselves? Might give it a shot. Okay. Now, if the plumber's a hundred bucks, you still placed. What if the plumber's 10,000 bucks? All of a sudden, I'm starting to overcome my aversion to shit, right? Now you're seeing what this is happening. Like, there's a, there's a thing that someone doesn't want to do. They don't want to get covered in shit. And they're perfectly willing to pay you to do it, as long as it's a reasonable price. And that's what these carry trades are. Now, this is the basis of perpetual futures. Now, perpetual futures conceptually are exactly like these quarterly futures that expire in this, um, the, the next one, for example, for Bitcoin expires in March. March, they expire technically. The price they expire at is a VWAP of the last five minutes of trading on the third Friday of the trading month in March. It's very important to know the contract specs if you're trading quarterly futures, though. Like, like, like it's very, very important. It's there's a big difference between the last Thursday and the last Friday. Like, there's big fucking differences, and they're all different. You got to, you just, it's just idiosyncratic knowledge. Perpetual futures save you all the hassle of having to know all this arcane knowledge. Like, for example. Yeah, there's a bunch of arcane knowledge that you have to know to, 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 to trade futures. You don't need to do that with perpetual futures. They just stay open. How do they stay open? There is a funding rate. The funding rate, we can see it here on Hyperliquid. Can be either negative or positive. If the... So I am... If I am long, I am paying 60% a year to be long. That's quite a lot. There's some other motherfucker, the other motherfucker on the other side of the, my trade is getting 60% a year, but he's getting 
0.0069 in of a percent, and he's getting that in 19 minutes 32, 19 minutes 30, 19 minutes 31. This is how it works. We have regular expiry rates. Binance expires every eight hours. Bybit expires every eight hours. Hyperliquid expires every hour. Some expire every hour, some expire every eight hours, some are every four hours, right? Like, and so every time that expiry happens, I want you to see what happens in my account. Um, so these are the funding payments that are going in and out of my account right now. So I got, I've got, I'm short dupe and I got paid a cent. I'm short FTT and I paid 21 cents. Last hour, 45 cents. Da -da 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 -da. Now I want you to show, I want to show you something really interesting. Let's look at this cocksucker. Fucking OX. This is that exchange from uh, Kyle Davies and Zhu Su, um, the scam exchange. And this is an obvious scam exchange. And I, I just put a thousand dollars in this just to just to force me to track it. It's only made one hundred and twenty nine dollars in profit, but my thousand dollar trade has given me four hundred and seventy five dollars in carry. That's a very attractive trade. This and and when was this trade in? This is like a month a month long trade. So this is a very very attractive carry trade. This is why I'm in this trade. I'm, you know, most likely going to double my money on this trade, most likely, um, just because of that. Okay, so these perpetual futures expire. Uh, these perpetual futures never expire. The next thing, if the future is above the index, if the perpetual is above the index, then longs pay the shorts. This makes it less attractive to be long and it makes it more attractive to be short. So the things balance out, right? And this should push things back to fair value. Do, does everyone understand that so far? This is the key thing that, that's all been building up to. If the perpetual is above the, is above the spot, longs have to pay shorts every eight hours, every hour. You have to pay a little bit. I'll show you. I'll show you in a few minutes, Miles. This it's really cool. Um, yes, have automated it. I'm going to show you. I'm going to give you all the tools. And I'm going to show you how to automate it today. Um, let's get to that. The other side of it is, if the index is above the perp, then the shorts have to pay the longs. So, what reason would the perp be below the index? And anyone reason through that, Ian? You got got some thoughts? Why would the perpetual futures be trading less than less than less than the spot price? Because there's more sellers than buyers, right? This is a if there's more sellers than buyers on the perpetual futures markets, which are the perpetual futures markets are quite liquid compared to the spot markets. You can't sell a tiny shit coin. You can't sell you can't sell hundred grand worth of a tiny shit coin without crashing the price. You can sell 100 grand worth of almost any perp without crashing the price. When this gets out of whack, this is a sign that that big players are hedging their bags. So there's two ways to get out of a position. If I own Pendle coin, if I own Spot Pendle, I can either sell my pot Spot Pendle for Bitcoin or for, for USD Tether, or I could own Pendle and short Pendle futures. And then I'm effectively directional neutral. So I'm no longer taking directional risk. And I might even be connecting, collecting funding, but not in this situation. If too many people do that, this is a very clear hidden sign that shit is getting out of whack. And let's look at Pendulum since we're talking about it. So you can see the funding rate. This is the eight hour funding rate. So can... And premium. So the premium is the difference between futures and spot. And this eventually, now, you can see 
that more people want to go long than want to go short, right? There's a premium. This is the, the premium is the difference between uh, the futures and the spot. If this is negative, more people want to go short than long. If this is positive, people more people want to go long than short. This becomes its own sort of indicator for us, which is completely unrelated to price. This is a very, very valuable thing to know and understand. This is this is not highly predictive, but reasonably predictive. Um, Gia, the, the, there's two ways that the premium can be used. When the premiums are way out of whack, it tells you that the demand is out of control. It tells you that demand for either shorting is out of control or buying is out of control. Now, let me show you something really cool. So if here I've got cyber, I've got the, the, the orange line is cyber during a pump. And the black line is the uh, it is the spot. You can see that when things get out of whack, this premium goes nuts to the downside. This looks like a very strong negative premium. Strong negative premium, strong negative premium, like not a little bit, but a lot. It's a sign to get the fuck out because someone else is dumping their bags. Very, very useful thing to understand and useful thing to know. And we see this again and again and again. This is, you strip the marketing bullshit away from the pump system, and that's what it is. That's how we know with this. It doesn't happen all the time, but most of the time it does. Okay. Because the perpetual future essentially expires eight hourly for most exchanges, it stays close, it stays much more closely tethered to the index than the expiring future. So they tend to look like this. They, they converge, they diverge, they come back, they diverge. And there's a number of trades that you can do. Now, I want to, let's say we're getting paid. Let's sort this by funding. Let's say we're getting paid. We're interested in going long shear. And we can get paid 1,000% a, a year to go long shear. Is that worth doing? You can get a thousand percent a year for doing it. Seems nice, isn't it? <laughs> you see many free lunches around here? You see many easy trades? Not too many lying around. But you're not so much. This one is one. So statistically, let me, let me show you the data. Okay, this is on Binance. These are all the negative funding rates, below 50%. And these are all the positive funding rates, above 50%. When you trade perpetual futures, you get your money in two ways. Way number one is you're getting the change in price. Like the, the coin goes up and I'm long, I make money. The coin goes up and I'm short and I lose money, right? The second way is that you get the funding payment. Now, the funding, the amount of money that you get from funding is in this, is these red dots. This is from the bottom. This is the bottom 1% of funding. So these crazy outlier ones, this is really, really well behaved, right? And the top funding is not quite as well behaved, but it's got some very interesting wrinkles. And this is what we see out in the tails. Carry behaves very differently. Why? Because Carry is caused by people dumping their bags and people going nuts, aping long. People going nuts, aping long are a little bit more predictable than, than, than manipulators dumping their bags. But on average, so if we look at, if we went long, everything that was negative funding rate 
in proportion with how negative it is. Like really negative, we're going to go super. We're going to go super long. Just a little bit negative, we're going to go a little bit long. And then as it gets positive, we're going to go short, and we're going to get the profit from price, which is the green dots, funding, which is the red dots, and the total is the blue dots. So if we look at the blue dots, roughly go up and to the right, right. And you can see that right out on the tails at the 100%, the 99, the 98, the 98%, these are highly profitable trades. The blue dots is the total amount of profit. You're highly profitable trades. So if we go back to hyperliquid and we go, let's sort by the other way. HPOS, let's look at HPOS. So you're getting paid 540% to go short. No, 540% to go long. Now, there's a trick here. This shit will change all the time, but funding rates technically are quite sticky. Yeah. I have this tool, which I'll post in the chat, everyone can use. If you went long, really the top three is fine. You could do the top five. And you went long these top three, Banana, Unibot, and OX, and you went short, HPOS, Friend, and ZRO. Who wants to take it? Who wants to take a stab at what that would look like, how that would work? And I know this is super technical and like, like this is rocket scientist level shit. This is not like drawing lines on charts and shit. But who wants to take it? Who wants to take a guess at it? We'll open up the mic if anyone wants to stab at it. Anybody wants to raise their hand and then we can just unlock you and Scott will be very gentle. And then you'll get some. Oh, yeah, everyone says that about me. One on one uh, coaching through this. So that's the. Uh... So, well, Russell, you, what we, this is a really good question. Russell says, in what context, price or premium harvesting? Well, you know, the premium harvesting is very, very well behaved. I'd love to, to just get the money from these, which is, which is returns from going long these. And I would love to get the returns from. from from going short these because they're going down. If you could just get the funding and and not trade the prices, well, that would be a dream come true. But I, no one, no one's ever kissed me on the dick that way. Like you can only get both together. That's the catch. And Russell, this is the key intuition is and shit for free. You're taking a risk. You get this very beautifully well-behaved funding. And the price changes, the price changes are in green. They're pretty good too. Like you're going, you're going along these bad boys and it's looking pretty good, but it's also noisy. You get some big losses here and there too, right? It, and it's pretty noisy. Now, we reduce that noise by taking a three-day average from this. So if you were to go long the three of these and you were to go short the three of these, what would you expect to happen if the market went up? Ian, what would you expect to happen if you're long three and you're short three and the market goes up? I expect one to go up and maybe one to go down. Exactly. You'd hope in a perfect world, you'd hope that your longs made money and your shorts lost money and you still got the funding payments, right? Mm -hmm. And you would hope that the amount that you lost matched out with the amount that you won and you would hope that the funding was the cherry on top that was the juice that made it all worth the squeeze oh yeah no this is absolutely nothing like a straddle Steph. a straddle is a very very different thing a straddle is a bet that price stays the same this is a bet that price moves and this is a bet that price that when the funding rate that the funding rate is predictive of price is the funding rate predictive of price? Hell fucking yeah, it is. How predictive is it? About as predictive as FinRef trend. So this is the next thing we're adding to FinRef, by the way. If you wanted to do this yourself, you'd load up this thing every day, you check, and you would take 
three of these trades long and three of these short. And these funding rates are quite sticky. So you might be in this in this trade for like weeks or months and you keep collecting those funding payments and you think that that's not going to add up, but like you can see it really adds up. I've got 589 bucks of, of funding on BLZ. Shit adds up. Now, as always, there's a catch. The catch is if your long trade goes up, you've got too much of it now because it made money. So now I haven't, you know, if my long trade goes up, um, that was over about a month. So it's it's not really a good example, Russell. So if your long trade goes up, you're now holding too much. If, if your short trade goes up, you're now holding too little. So you have to rebalance those. And the way that you would do that is equal weighting. So I would want three thousand. I would want three thousand dollars worth of longs, and I would want three thousand dollars worth of shorts, or five thousand dollars worth of longs, and five thousand dollars worth of shorts. And every day, you would wake up and you would say, "Okay, I checked my account, and how how much have I got in OX? I've got a thousand and fifty. This will modify itself every day. This will go to eleven hundred. It'll go down to a thousand. It started off at a thousand. Now it's a you, you know, this will change. And so when it changes, you have to like sell a little bit or buy a little bit. That's how it works. So this is a very, how much how much do, do, do these trades work out? On average, this works out to about 200% a year, which sounds good and is good. Fucking amazing, actually. The catch is you get 200% a year and you get to watch everyone else make 1,000% from a bull market. And so you're sitting on the sidelines you know, drinking hate or anything. Okay, so the key intuition here, that, and this is the maths behind it, if we look at, say, if a perpetual future is above the spot price, that doesn't change very much. It's likely to stay the same. And you can see that it, this has mostly stayed the same. Like for a, for a long, long period of time, it wiggles. And... Coin funding rate. Same link. And this is the funding rate. You can see it's been long for a long time. Like, you know, it wiggles, but it's sticky. And, and Russell, this intuition is great. This works perfectly when it goes sideways. Stefan has a very, very good question. Will this work better in a bear market? It works in a bear market, it works in a bull market, but it works best when everything's stable. It shits the bed when we switch from bull to bear. And what that looks like is... Might take me a while to find. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll show you in a different way. So the funding rates are sticky. Like, like this is the heart of the edge. If the funding rate is negative, it's probably going to stay negative. Like you can see here in BNB, it's mostly positive with only one little gap. It's good for fin. It, it, this mixed with FinRev is really good. And that's why we're automating it and, and putting it in. So you guys all have this. The funding rates are sticky. And because it costs us to trade and switch positions, and especially this really trashy stuff, like out on the tails, we can see that this is our actual funding and this is our predicted funding. And we can see that there's a fairly linear relationship as in, as in a three-day average or a five-day average is actually quite a reasonable prediction. So our funding rate today is predictive of our funding rate in three days. And this is a very important thing to understand. Now, the funding rates are sticky. If the funding rate is negative, it's probably going to stay negative. If it's positive, it's going to stay positive. Now, this is on Hyperliquid, which is the exchange I happen to be trading on here. And you can see here is our returns from price. The red dot is our returns from funding. And the total is a return here. So this is this is zero and this is positive. This is our returns from total returns, which is the blue dot, and the green dot is the price returns, and the red dot is the funding. 
you can see that out in the very tails of this distribution, we've got a predicted negative return. So we can, sh if we've got a predictive negative return, you can short something and make money, right? And we're making, and we've got a predictive negative funding and we've got a predictive positive funding. So we've got like mathematical evidence that we're on solid ground here. It's just kind of a cunty thing to do. And it works on Binance, uh, it works on, it works on Bybit. And, and, you know, the funding payments, that's the juice that, that makes the squeeze. So let's talk about more of the mechanics of shorting. So when you're going to short something, it's exactly like going long. You're selling something that you don't own. And the easiest way to think about it is it's a bet that the market goes down. Short is a bet that the market goes down. When you buy, you close that short. So how do the how do the how does the action work? Um, let's short some Bitcoin. Okay, this is our order book. The first thing we're going to do is the same with every exchange. Is we're going to in in very liquid coins like Bitcoin and Ethereum and Solana and small positions, you can use market orders. If you're trading a shit coin, you've got to use limit orders. A limit order is either get me in at that price or don't get me in at all. So you know what you're getting. But that might take a while to get filled. It might take five minutes. Okay, so here I'm going to use market. I'm going to sell short. I'm going to use this slider to turn this up and you're going to see the order value. We don't want to sell 220 grand worth. Let's, I don't even want to sell. So we're going to sell 400 bucks worth of Bitcoin. 0 0.01 Bitcoin. Let's let's get this trade on, and then we'll talk about stop losses and and shit like that. Okay, so to get this trade on, if it's a market, it'll it'll. Um, the funding rate is on the nominal price. That's a really good question. So if you use twenty x leverage, if I, the funding rate here is an annualized ten point nine five percent a year. Not a big deal on Bitcoin, a very big deal on one of those really big shit coins where it could be three or four or five hundred percent. So, and the the leverage doesn't eat into the funding rate return; it, it multiplies it. No, it doesn't mean you have to pay sixty percent of that that amount to the exchange. No, it doesn't at all. So, the funding rates happen every eight hours or every hour in hyperliquid. They, they just happen, they bang, they bang, they bang. And you can see you'll always have a total list of how much funding. And you can see the trades that we've been taking. We've got out of the seven trades that are open, two of them are negative, And mostly we've made money on our funding. I tend to make money on funding just because, um, you know, as a discretionary trader, I tend to be like smarter than the average bear. Um, so we're going we're gonna to place this order for market. Actually, let's not do Bitcoin because I've already got a Bitcoin trade open. Let's do something else. Um, let's do ADA. What the fuck not? Okay, so what is? Do, does everyone know what the difference between a market order and a... Um, Gee, a market is higher fees. Richard, yes, I did call a long and pendle. Um, we'll have a look at that. Okay. So for a market order says, go down the order book and fill me here. If I've got too big an order, then fill up this one, then fill up this one, then fill up this one, then fill up this one. Now, if we look at the shape of this, it's quite thin here. The spread is only 0.01%, but if I want to get 100 grand worth, I'm going to run through this order book. And these market makers who are in this order book, they're going to love me because if you think about what a market maker does, 
a market maker provides convenience. Most of the time, it, if it wasn't for market makers, I would have to wait till there was another guy like Ian who wanted to sell some ADA before I could buy some ADA. And that would be a ball ache for me. That would be a really inconvenience to my day. I'd have to wait hours and hours and hours. With a market maker, I can get filled just like that, go on with my day, but he gets to buy it below what it's worth. And this is the key to trading. If you're buying shit below what it's worth, because I was in a rush, I was in a rush, I was in a hurry. Let's sell this short. Let's short 200 acres. Order submitted, bam. You can see how it did that right way. Now, let's close that position. Let's close it at market price. Now let's do the same thing at a market. Let's do the same thing at limit. And you can usually click on mid price. And, and I'm trying to get this price right in the middle. So let me try and sell it a bit expensive. 49,244. So what I'm going to do is this is me right here with the dot. See that? See how I'm not filled yet? This is my line. The market has to go there before I get filled. So I'm not paying it. I'm paying lower fees. Now I got filled. So can everyone see what happened there? Instead of that instant gratification, I pressed the button and I got positioned. I had to wait. How long did we wait? Like five seconds, something like that? I paid less fees. I got a better price but I had to wait. Now you can understand what a market maker is. A market maker provides convenience and you tip them. You tip them like a doorman, like a taxi driver. Don't forget to tip your friendly neighborhood market maker. That's what they do. They're not, they're not running your stops. They're not doing any of the bullshit. They're not moving them. They're not manipulating the market. Well, that sometimes they do, but, but, they, but their general business is if you wanted to, if, if you could be fucked and you can, be a market maker yourself. If you wanted to do some market making, you would pick the, the shittiest shit coin that you can buy. I'm just going to get out of that thing and let's close at market price. And let's go look at what that cost us. So we paid two, I've paid, see how this one, when I opened the, when I opened the trade at limit, I didn't pay any fees. But the other ones, I paid two cents. I paid the exchange for the convenience and I paid the market maker. Now, here's my close P&L on those trades. I lost four cents on the market on, on the second one and I lost six cents on the first one. Now, if you wanted to play it being a market maker yourself, you could pick the shittiest shit coin that you could possibly imagine. And I happen to know this is one because I've been in the order book and it sucks ass. So this is what it looks like. All these little dashed lines are where no actual trades took place. So this is a market which is not, if we compare this to Bitcoin, you'll see that Bitcoin flashes up and down like, like millisecond times. It's like, doo -doo 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 -doo. you have to be a computer to do this. If we compare this to say OX, If I see how it's not, it's literally not moving at all. This is slow enough that you can be a market maker. Now you can experiment with leaving an order placed here. You're going to sell it very cheap. If someone wants to buy it and they hit market buy, they're going to they, they they're going to fill you. If you want to place, if you wanted to sit in front of the screen eight hours a day and leave some orders in here to sell and some orders in here to buy, at the end of the day almost certainly you would make money. And why? Because someone comes along and, and every now and again, this is a market order. Someone hit market sell and they ran through the order book. Someone hit market sell and they ran through the order book. Someone hit market, it was too cheap. Someone hit market buy, ran through the order book. Every now and again, someone's going to come. You can see on the chart in a really thin coin, market buys, market sells, market buys, multiple market buys, market sells. So these guys are drastically overpaying and fucking themselves because they, because they can't be bothered waiting. 
Perry says, I do this with nano size precious metal miners. This is what market making is. This is what this is how market makers work. Um, it's a useful, it, it, it's a useful thing to play around with. But we're getting off topic here. Um, let's go to my list of questions that I have. I think we've covered a lot today. Um yeah, it's been an absolute cracker. Okay, so everyone understands what perpetual futures are, how they're different from traditional markets. We talked about the manipulating, we talked about the funding rates, happens every eight hours or one hour, depending on the exchange. How to short. Okay, so let's compare this with margin short. There's two ways to bet that a coin goes down. The first way is to borrow that coin. And I've got up, these are the Binance borrow rates. And you can see that there's a 2.8, um, let's look at Bitcoin. You can borrow Bitcoin for shorting for shit, 1% 1, 1 a year. That's pretty. That's a pretty good deal. Um, there can be an arbitrage between margin borrow and perpetual futures. So, for example, if you can borrow this cheap and then invest it in a perpetual future and get the funding, and there's a difference in those two interest rates, there's an arbitrage. There's a risk-free trade for you to do. If these funding rates are different on hyper-liquid than Binance, there's an arbitrage. You can go long one on Binance and short one on Hyperliquid. And as long as an exchange doesn't go broke and you keep them balanced, you can have the difference in funding rate. This is more like what traders who work for big banks do a lot of. They do a lot of this stuff. Why? Because no one really wants to bet their job that the market's not going to move and I'm going to predict that the, this is going to happen before the halving and this is going to happen after the halving. No one who's no one who's trying to keep a job for 40 years is really comfortable doing shit like that because it's patently dumb, right? Like even though we do a fair bit of it, it's, it's like not that. It, it's not, a, it, you can only do it in a bull market, right? And so there's a, a variety of arbitrages there. Um, how to hedge a bag with perps. And the banks have massive funding. They exactly right, Perry. Okay, how shorting differs. From, oh, okay. Key intuition: a successful long will grow. If you buy Amazon at hundred bucks and it goes to a thousand, Amazon is now ninety percent of your portfolio. A successful short shrinks. If you short Tesla at a thousand bucks, it goes down to five hundred bucks. You don't have a big Tesla short position anymore. It gets, it shrinks. So that's the difference. When do you exit a short? There's a couple of a couple of places. When the cost of borrow starts to go through the roof, when the funding rates go like, and you're short, what that tells you is that someone's about to get squeezed. So if you're short something, now let's look at our positions that we that I've got on. Hey, we've made seven hundred and fifty six bucks on fucking Pendle. Fuck yeah, fuck yeah. Fuck yeah. And we've lost three bucks on the funding. When this funding starts to go nuts, fuck yeah. What do we do when we show a profit, by the way? We add to a position, generally. The order book look like. Yeah, I don't want to. Okay, so here you don't want to be a dick for a tick. If I put it in the middle, I'm not going to get filled. Um, this is my new order, and you can see me with the dot here, right? Now I get, well, someone else has outbid me. That's a market maker. They've outbid me. They don't want me to be first. Now, I, now they got filled. Now I'm waiting to get filled. You can see how you might press market buy just because you don't want to wait. This is like, for some people, not me, this is nerve wracking. And we still, and now we're filled. So that wait was the difference between a limit and a market order. When you're in a fast moving 
No, that's not always an algo market maker. Um, but in this in this instance, it was just because uh, humans aren't quick enough to to do that shit. It, a really fast human could have been that, but it wasn't. It was. You can assume that market makers are automated. Okay, back to what we we're talking about. When to exit a short? There's a couple of ways. There's firstly, if you've if you've got an edge, when that edge disappears, you got to get out. So, for example, we were in short FTT because there was a rumor that the exchange was going to reopen. That was obvious bullshit. That was like one of the most never going to happen things that never ever happened. And I'm mostly out of that position. I've got orders here to get out at limit just because. I don't want to pay. So we shorted it here. Now, the exchange has actually announced that they're definitely not open. They're definitely shutting it down. This coin is definitely worthless. So now everyone knows the thing that we thought we knew ahead of everyone else. Everyone else thought that FTX might reopen. We thought that was never going to happen. That was our view. When that edge disappears, when it collapses... We've got no business being in the trade. I'm just trying to get. I'm just trying to get cute and get out. I'm like three quarters out of this position, and I've got two limit orders, which will. Let's have a look at them. Here and here. The second time that you exit a short is when a short squeeze happens. Now let's find a short squeeze. There'll be one in FTT. So everyone was very short this because it was obvious it was a shit coin. And then these squeezes can happen a lot. You can see it went from like a buck 40 up to six bucks. There's technically no limit to how far a short can go. So a long can only go to zero. You buy 10 grand worth of pendle. If, if you fuck up, the worst you can lose is 10 grand. If you short 10 grand worth of pendle and it goes up 10, 10 times, you're down 100 grand and counting. Like it could go to anything. If you didn't see it going to, if you didn't see it going up 10x, it could go up 100x and then you're fucked. You'll be liquidated long before that. So shorts are the only place where you can justify having a stop loss. Where should your stop loss be? For a short? And when should you, I, I don't often use stop losses. I use stops on very, very thin and really bad shit coins that, that, are, that are capable of being squeezed. So short squeezes are a thing. If it start, price starts going up, everyone's going to have to cover their shorts. Covering their shorts is buying, so it's going to create this buying pressure, blah, blah, blah. So that's the time when I use stops is shorting really shitty coins. Um, anything else you guys want to know about this stuff? Yep. Barry, you shouldn't hate the algos better in your orders. Your, those algos, are, they're pussies, dude. Like, you can chase them around. You can... You should be very grateful that they exist. This was this is a much more difficult game when they weren't there. Any other questions on this? I think we've done a, like a really, really deep dive here. That is really awesome. And I'm going to repost a couple of questions. Maybe you've already done them. This is one from Michael uh, Ritchie. Okay. Why do a three-day average? This is really good. So... These funding rates are always changing. So let's pick... Um, let's pick Pendle. Pick something smaller. Ethereum Classic. And let's look at it. This is a five-minute chart. So these, these, these funding rates are always changing up or down. This funding rate is quite predictive. If the funding rate is, they're around here because it's quite predictive. If we look at it on uh, an eight hour basis, if it's high, it's probably gonna stay high. Not forever, but for at least long enough for, for us to get a profit. If, it's, if our funding rate is high, it's probably gonna stay high for a couple of days. Three days and five days are perfectly acceptable things. You make more money if you do it quicker, like on a one day, you, you, you make more money, but you have more turnover. And turnover is both very difficult to manage and very expensive and easy to fuck up. So for me, 
three days is about the sweet spot. Now, let me show you, let me show you the maths behind it because I know everyone loves it when I fucking talk about maths. This is um, the new FINREV cross-sectional carry system that we're adding. This is the sharp ratio at a different buffer value. So if we wait, if we trade it when it gets 2.5% out of whack, this is our maximum sharp ratio of 1.6, which is really good. FINREV is 1.7. Carry is almost as good as FINREV. It's a bit more cunty. But it's very, very sensitive. You can see how sensitive it is to doing like a five-day, a seven-day, a 10-day kind of average. If you did like a 10-day average, you drop that down to like below 0.7, which is still okay. It's still worth doing, but it's not like 1.6 is amazing. 0.7 is, yeah, maybe, if I could be fucked. Is the premium indicator good for high time frames? You can't, you have to use it in context here. Um, Jaguar, can a stop loss be overrun in a volatile market? No. So <laughs> there's two types of stop loss. There's a stop loss on our pendle. So we're going to edit our take profit or our stop loss. We're going to put the stop loss price. Actually, let me just. Let's say we put a stop loss. Never place your stop losses at round numbers, by the way. That's a dumb idea. You. So let's edit our stop loss. And we're going to put this at two bucks fifty. And you can click limit price, and it'll say so. What a stop loss does is, as soon as one trade happens at that price or lower, it it converts it to a market order and just runs through the order book. That's what you want to do. Because when you get out, you're trying to save your ass. You're not trying to get the best price you can. You're a, you're in the getting fucked business. It's just a question of how fucked you get. If you want to put a limit price, which I would recommend you never, ever do, you can say the stop loss limit price is 2 bucks 40 So we say my stop loss kicks in at 2 bucks 50 and it's, gonna, it's not going to fill unless I get 2 bucks 40 or better, in which case... Like all financial markets, there are very few free lunches. There's not a lot of nothing for nothing in this game. It's pretty competitive. The risk that you take is that you're going to get overrun and you're not going to get filled at all. It's going to drop down to a dollar and you and you're going to be like, fuck. If you if you have a a, a no limit price stop loss, so let's place this stop loss on. You can see here's our stop. Here's our liquidation price. Where it's gonna where it's gonna gank us. If it gets to here, I'm gonna lose all the money in this account. No, actually, this this is trade. Yeah, this is cross money. It's gonna liquidate all my trades and cash me out. If it gets to here, if it gets to here, it's gonna it, it's gonna just sell my trade at market. And I don't want to stop loss on it because I rarely use stop losses on longs. Um, Gia, is the premium indicator good for high time frames? Um, you don't identify a short this way. You just like view what's going on. This is more like the like the weatherman. You walk outside and go, "Wow, I'm getting wet. It's probably raining right now." Oh, the sky is blue. Wow, it's sunny. And that is, if it's raining right now, a reasonable man would say. Well, that funding rate, the rain, is kind of predictive of probably going to be raining in 20 minutes, right? Like, it would be an unreasonable bet to walk outside, it's raining, and then to say, I'm not going to take my umbrella, right? That would be a dumb bet. Yeah. If you walk outside, it's a beautiful, glorious day. You can see that there's a situation where you'd need an umbrella, but there's no reason to fucking take one, right? Like, don't be stupid. Don't be pussy. So we're not, it's more like the things that you can infer that are real and not bullshit are when it changes from sunny to cloudy. Wow, I should, I might want to take my umbrella now. You know, that's a, re, that's a reasonable inference. If it's sunny, probably going to stay sunny at least until I go out and come back. If it's raining, I probably want to take an umbrella. I don't want to bet that it's going to fine up like right now, 
Like that's that's how you, you do it. And you can, I I, I prefer to use Velodata, Coinalyze. Um, there's a bunch of others. Perry, I don't. This is a great question. This is the question of all. Stop losses are almost always negative expected value. Everyone who uses stops thinks they're being cute and I'm capping my risk. And, and they also think this dumb shit that I've got this risk reward ratio, the difference between my entry price and my stop loss and my target, and I've got a three to one, that's all bullshit. I used to think that. I designed systems around that. I taught that. I told people that I was wrong. Um, it would get to, to use stop losses in any institutional environment anywhere in the world will get you laughed out of the room. And we know this is true for a couple of reasons. For a start, market makers are absolutely loving people using stops. And a disproportionate amount of market maker profits come from people's stop losses. So there's nothing that finance markets are a, a, a case of no free lunches. So if you think you're going to cut your risk, what you're really doing is you're also cutting your return. And what happens is that you cut your expected return by more than you cut your risk. What situations, let's say it comes down and hits your stop loss, knocks you out of your long trade and then goes on, would have been a winner anyway. Does that Has that ever happened to you, Ian? Yeah. Happened to me too. That is almost by definition a shitty situation, right? Like it hit my stop loss and the trade worked. I was right, but I lost money. That's a negative expected value. And no one's, everyone always sees oh, if it hit my stop loss, you're just assuming that it's going to keep going down. But you don't fucking know that. You don't know shit about the future. You really don't have a crystal ball. It's entirely possible that it hits your stop loss and then does the thing you said it was going to do. Nearly always stop losses represent either a cognitive mistake, you're fucking stupid, or a sizing mistake, you're trading too big. If you have to get up in the middle of the night to look at your positions, your positions are too big. Sell them down to the sleeping level. Hmm. Um, Gia, what are my thoughts on CSI now? They're a necessary for CSI because you're an intraday trader, like um, you're taking a lot of trades. It's definitely negative expected value. It definitely reduces the return of the system. But reducing the return for the convenience of it and the fact that you can set a trade and walk out the door and go live your life without having to watch it, yeah, that's worth it. Um, but it's... It, it's definitely negative expected value in every situation that you can think of. We good? I think we are. Yeah. What a Hell, fun. motherfucking yes. I think this was a great trade, great day, and and uh, I made a thousand bucks. So thanks for pushing me into Pendle, whoever it was that did that. Um, yeah. Nice. See you in the group. Ta-da. Be good.